Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I welcome you today also, and so do the master gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco counties. So before I begin, oftentimes I get asked, well, what exactly are the master gardeners? So the Master Gardeners are a statewide program that is operated on a county basis. And we operate under the umbrella of the University of California. So we're trained by UC specialists who are involved in current research and education in their area of expertise. So as trained volunteers and representatives of UC, we provide UC research-based gardening information to residents of our counties, whether they are home gardeners, such as yourselves, or members of community organizations. And there are no charge for our services, although donations are always appreciated. So let's see. I want to first start about with the advantages of container gardening. So some of the advantages, and this actually is a picture of, uh, of a big planter on my patio. And the reason I just, I thought this workshop in San Francisco would be really good is that many people who live here don't have gardens, or if they do, like I do, I like to have container gardening on my patio, or you might want to have some containers on your balcony, your back porch, your steps, wherever you can squeeze them in. Um, and what container gardening does is it brings the plants up close and personal. So you could really see them as wherever you're sitting. Um, and so here are some of the other advantages of container gardening. There, the portability, we can move containers and we can <clears throat> move them if they plants need more sun or more shade. We can move those containers um, and that provides flexibility. And even with the seasons, the sun or shade can vary in your outdoor area or, you know, in winter, obviously there's less um, sun and in summer there's more sun um, and then it in spring and fall uh, you know the the equinox is an equal amount of light and day and don't forget folks we turn back our clocks one hour tonight speaking of time changes so we have flexibility the other thing you could do with containers it's really quite dramatic is you, you can make groupings. So you can bring a number of containers together to really make a statement like three or five, or depending on the size of your containers, maybe one is just to stand out and you want that container to stand out by itself. Um, and in this case, you could kind of see peeking through the leaves of my lemon tree, which is in a container, it's a dwarf lemon, and spilling over the sides, because remember this is filler, spiller, thriller, is calabrosia or a million bells. And But behind the leaves of the lemon tree is a drink pipe that I really don't find that attractive in my environment. So in this case, I'm screening picture was taken a couple of years ago. Now it's fully screened by my plantings. So you can hide some eyesores. And what are some of the challenges of container gardening? Well, some of the challenges are that if you're going to put a number of plants in the same pot, you want to make sure that they have the same needs for sun or shade or water and feeding or fertilization. So another challenge can be people try to get in too many plants in the same container, so overcrowding. Um, the other 
challenge is choosing the wrong size container. Uh, many gardeners or novice gardeners are afraid of putting the wrong colors together. And, you know, that if you need more, if con containers do need more frequent watering than plants planted in soil in your garden environment. Um, and another challenge is that people face is that you want the container to have adequate drainage and not be sitting in its own water pool. So an uh, answer to this is many people put blocks or bricks to elevate their container slightly so that the water actually does run off and drain. So what are some of our typical containers? So some typical containers are one that's featured in this picture of terracotta or clay pots and uh, plastic pots. These are all pots, by the way, you can find at the nursery. And there's, there's even a couple of additional ones I don't have on this list, but terracotta, plastic, Wooden, one of the disadvantages of sometimes cypress or cedar containers is that they're subject to dry rot over time and they might disintegrate over time where you're replacing them more often. Um, stone or concrete containers are super heavy to move. Um, we have baskets, which are more lightweight. There are fiberglass containers that are very, very uh, lightweight, and some are even made portable now with wheels on them. And we have metal containers. Um, these can be subject to corrosion, so you need to monitor any metal, metal, metal containers closely. And then there's the paper pulp containers that you also see at the nursery. And one that's not here is that I've seen more people using are the, the bags um, that are hung from a fence or hung from a trellis. And I believe several of the San Francisco nurseries sells these green bags for doing herbs or plants in, and they're very portable and easy to move. So how do you choose your container? So we'll, we'll start with that, right? So consider the size of the container in relationship to the growth of the plant that you're picking to go in the container. So um, a normal good ratio or a scale to keep in mind is that the size of your container um, should be uh, about, we use a one, one to two ratio. So the size of your container should be one time, one times the height and the size of your thriller plant, which is going to be, we're going to get to that in a minute, is going to be your tallest plant in the container, should be no more than two times the size of your container. And a one-to-one -one ratio is also considered very good. So a one-to-one -one ratio or a one-to-two ratio. Um, and we talked about sizing that to scale. Does your container have adequate drainage? So the bigger the container, the more holes you may need at the bottom, drainage holes for drainage. So an average six size, um, six inch size clay pot at the nursery usually has just one drainage hole and that's adequate. But if you start moving into larger size containers, you're going to need sometimes two drainage holes to three drainage holes, depending on what size you're going to. And does your container have or lack porosity? And that is um, like, like clay 
clay pots breathe, um, where plastic pots do not. So another thing to consider, like black plastic pots, tomato plants love them because they capture and retain the heat um, from the area and sun that you're putting the plant. Other plants may not like that kind of environment. So factors affecting the choice, your choice, also include the mobility of the container. So do you need a plant dolly? So in this instance, the plant is ceramic and some con containers, as this one is, it's probably a bit heavy to begin with because it looks like it's at least, you know, 16 inches tall and probably 12 to 14 inches at the biggest diameter. So once you put soil in there and get your plants in there, then that mobility factor, which is an advantage of container gardens, may go to the wayside. So how do you counter this before you set up your, your dolly, um, plant caddies, they're also called, um, in the area you want your contain to feature your container plant and <clears throat> make sure that when you get the soil in there, you can move it easily and then uh, proceed to your actual planting of your selection. And just keeping in mind that wet plants are really heavy. So with watering and, you know, if you put these plants on drip irrigation or whether you hand water, um, when the soil is wet, it weighs a lot more than dry soil. So tips for success. <clears throat> Now these include, the master gardeners have this saying, to plant the right plant in the right place. And so what do we mean by this? So it's to really know your site um, and your microclimate for your neighborhood. And if you've lived in a, an apartment, a house, a dwelling for a while, you, you come to observe you know, where the sun hits, is it late afternoon sun? Is it morning sun? Is it sun six hours a day? Um, and within our neighborhood of San Francisco, it can vary to fog and more fog and cold and wind out in the Sunset District or the Richmond District of San Francisco to over here in Noe Valley or the Mission District or Potrero Hill, where I live, <clears throat> our microclimate is much sunnier. So begin to notice in your neighborhood, if you haven't already, what is the microclimate and what's the specific microclimate of your deck or your balcony or wherever you're going to put these containers. So that includes noticing sun or shade for how long, when does the wind come up? Because a lot of sun and a lot of wind will demand extra water for your planting containers because they dry the soil out. And where is your water availability? Do you have a hose or a water spigot nearby where you can easily fill a watering can to take care of your plants? Um, or again, of course, there's drip irrigation. There's also planters now that have water reservoirs at the bottom. And people tend to like these if they travel or they go away for any extended periods of time. And then <clears throat> do you have unwanted creatures in your habitat, in your uh, garden or back, back patio, deck, et cetera? Are there deer? Are there raccoons? Um, we don't see too many rabbits here. Perhaps that's more common on in San Mateo County, but and we don't see too many deer here, but we get our fair share and more of raccoons. 
<clears throat> in fact, raccoons are called the urban gorillas of San Francisco because they are very, very adaptable and um, they hound a lot of San Francisco gardeners. Raccoons are known to dig up tulip bulbs. Um, another master gardener I know used the analogy that tulip bul bulbs are like chocolate cake to a raccoon. Um, and I've had my tulip bulbs dug up, whether in containers or out in the garden. So I take measures now with creating these dome-like environments to keep them out. Um, we're seeing more squirrels around. People in, the in my neighborhood in Noe Valley are commenting, there's definitely more squirrels, uh, raccoons in San Francisco. Um, but if you live, I don't know where everyone's dialing in from, um, out in the East Bay or San Mateo County, you may be uh, hounded by deer that jump fences and uh, rabbits. And then consider, as I mentioned before, the weight of the containers and how that applies to your mobility. So how do you choose the right plant? Okay, so <clears throat> if we look at this slide, on the left side of the plant, gardeners are usually most inclined to pick the plant on the far left because it's really bushy and it looks really full and it does look healthy, right? So first of all, you wanna plant, pick a plant with no signs of pest or disease. And you can always look on the underside of the leaves of a plant that you're considering purchasing at a nursery to see if you can see with the naked eye or if you have a magnifying glass, are there any signs of disease? And short of that, you can look at the leaves and are there bite marks in the leaves? Are there, you know, are the tips of the leaves um, chewed up? Um, you want to avoid those kind of plants, right? But really your best choice between these three options is to pick the, the, the plant in the middle. And that's because it has, although it doesn't look as, as full and robust as the one to the left, it has more buds on it. So what's going to happen is after you plant it, you'll get more flowers over time where the one on the left is almost at peak flowering right now. And that may be after you get it in your container may already be losing its um, flowering ability in six weeks or so. Whereas the one with the buds is going to give you a lot of a lot more enjoyment. <clears throat> now for perennials. And so perennials are plants that are healthy year round, whereas you will hear the term annuals and perennials, where annuals usually last only a season or sometimes a year, but then they die back where perennials give you a lot more life from the plant, and sometimes they come back for several years. Um, so for flowering peren perennials, you want many buds, not many flowers, to enjoy the blossoms, as I said earlier, for the whole season. And uh, this rule does not apply to annuals like uh, petunias, pansies, um, the things that come out that you're going to see in the nurseries in spring. Um, so different set of guidelines for perennials and annuals. So for flowering containers, um, sometimes what people have found is in terms of creating a successful container is to to have a combination of perennials and annuals are key. 
um, the annuals will give you that real punch of color and will bloom like crazy um, for a shorter period of time. And the perennials have oftentimes a colorful foliage. So in this picture, you could see that the grass here um, is the perennial and that provides both it's also the thriller in this application, having the most height. And that also provides um, texture, interest, uh, color. Many grasses, people think of gra grasses or um, carexes as only being green. But there are beautiful grasses, fountain grass, um, et cetera, that can be used in containers and give this element of surprise. And that you won't have to be replacing often. And as I said earlier, perennials can live more than a year um, on average. Some can go for two or three years. Um, and there is this disclosure comment, although not always, some people, depending again on your location and your care, um, may find they have to replace their perennials um, more often than one year. So here we're talking about, just very briefly, because entire workshops are devoted to color concept. I mean, I think City College had a botanical workshop on color theory that was one whole semester. But for just a quick, you know, people ask, well, gosh, what color should I pick for my container? You know, and, and how does this go, you know, with the, with the container I'm picking and the flowers and the, um, the, the, in general, working together in a cohesive way. So um, I think the main thing to draw your attention to is that generally you can pick colors that are either, um, if you want harmony in the container, most people will probably not pick all three of the primary colors. But they may, in this application on the very top row in the middle, pick colors that are analogous. Like we have the yellow and we have the light orange and then the deep orange. And you could do this all across the color wheel to down below at the 6 p.m. position under above you, you could pick a um, lighter violet um, going to a deep purple. And those work well together. Another comment to make is that complementary colors that are opposite, and that's on the color wheel. So in the color wheel, we have the yellow at the 12 o'clock position and the purple at the six o'clock position. And those work very well together. They're opposite and they're complementary. And then also um, split complementary, which is down on the bottom row in the middle will also work very well together. But to sum it all up, you could certainly, if you're interested in color theory, there's wonderful books that are out on the subject. But I also tell people, go with what your eye is drawn to. If you, you could sometimes look around your house and if there's certain colors that you like to use in decorating, right? That may be true for the colors that you would be drawn to. And are you in a, and if you're decorating as old and you're tired of your colors, then that's something to look at. But in general, go to what attracts your eye. And that can change as we age and as we progress in time. The colors that you liked in your 20s maybe aren't the same colors that you're drawn to in your 50s or 60s. So just stay tuned to that and go with your gut in terms of 
what colors would I really like to see in this container? And if you picked your pot first that you want, you could go around the nursery and try some of the four inch pots in that pot and see how's it working with the pot. You know, if it's a terracotta container, then maybe you want to soften that look with um, a light blue or, you know, a, a green, get some green in there. There's just all kinds of possibilities, but go with what is pleasing to your eye. So what is, let's get right into the meat of it here. What is the spiller thriller filler approach? So it's more <clears throat> to container gardening. So it is a principle I will share with you that designers use to create very um, outstanding and interesting container gardens. But it's not, it applies to, the, to us as everyday back garden gardeners. Because if we use these concepts, we too can create these stunning, lush, I think that's in the title, lush containers. So what are the elements that we want to see in a spiller thriller filler? Well, one of the elements that I mentioned is height. So the, your height in your container is your thriller. So that's going to be usually your tallest specimen. And that can be um, such plants as uh, uh, cordyline, uh, caladium. There's a number of them. Um, a palm. I've seen some people use palms. Again, this depends on your sunshade. Ornamental grasses. In this case, we're showing an ornamental grass. So that is your thrill component. And your fill factor are the plants that you use. So the thriller, the thriller adds drama, right? And the filler is plants that you're using to uh, fill in the planter um, and create, you know, a feeling of lushness in the planter. So the fill the, the filler plants are really important and they each one has a job to do. So they fill in, they bring cohesion, and they bring beauty to the planter. And then to create movement in your planter, you want spillers. So in this case, this looks like creeping Jenny in this photograph. And it, you see it, it's draping over the edge of the pot. It's spilling over the edge of the pot. So there you have the movement. It doesn't appear static. You look at this container and you see not only beauty, but movement and drama. And those are the factors you're trying, um, striving to bring to your arrangements. Now, this takes a little practice, and you may first start with a smaller container to try out the principles and see how you do. And actually, this size container featured here um, would be like considered a medium sized container. A smaller one might be like an eight to 10 inch pot, and just experiment with it. Remember, gardening is. Um, it's part science and part art. So you won't know. It's like an artist doing a painting. Somebody said this in a workshop I went to today, but we're painting with nature. So first experiment and try it out in a smaller pot and see what you like, what really resonates with you and see what you don't like, right? Because, And that's how we learn and that's how we get um, better. So with time, you'll be creating, you'll be able to create larger containers if, if that's what you want. 
So again, the filler space, the filler plants packing this middle space with texture and color, the spiller adding movement and uh, gracefulness to the planter, and the thriller adding drama and vertical height. So here's some examples here. Um, so Thriller is an upright spiky plant. Um, in this case, uh, it looks like Ukara in the background. We have uh, some petunias, it looks like, in the middle. And then this is Dusty Miller, which would be the drapey spiller plant draping over the edges. So in all three photos, we're embodying these principles again. And I like to tell people, even if you look at flower arranging, right, that I took a flower arranging class once for one semester, and I liked it, but and I learned a lot, and I realized there were principles from flower design that even apply to this container design because they use the same concepts of thriller, filler, spiller. In this picture to the far right, it looks like coleus is being used in this application as a spiller um, draping over the edge of the container. Now, what about, okay, so you have this pot, right? So we're gonna use the example of a 12 inch pot. And you have this pot. And so where do you put the thriller, the filler, and the spiller? So in this case, the normally, and oftentimes I, I'm going to step back a moment. And, and this isn't to make it complicated, but to be very clear that it depends on where you're going to be viewing this pot from. If you're looking at the pot head on, and you won't be seeing it from the sides, then your thriller can be placed in the back of the pot where number two is. But if you're seeing the pot from all sides, you know, if you walk beyond it, if you're, if you're walkway um, up the stairs to your balcony or out to your deck, you're going to be seeing it from the side, the front, and the back then the cardinal rule is you want number one, which is the thriller, in the middle of your pot. Okay, and then in, in this case, it's the yellow. This is a smaller pot, and this is, is an, a perfect example of what I said to maybe experiment with, if you haven't done this before. In the beginning, this is perfect picture for this. So in this case, they've used the yellow marguerite daisy, the angelonia um, in the mist blue, and the shockwave denim petunia as the filler spiller. So <clears throat> the riller in the middle, the blue angelonia, which is the spiller on the front and back and number three the shockwave denim petunia as it looks like here the spiller so thriller one two marguerite daisy uh thriller angelonia is your filler and three is your spiller or the shockwave denim so one, two, and three. So when viewed from all sides, the thriller plant is placed in the middle of the pot. And then you then plant your spiller and your filler. And you want to make sure when you take those plants out of their four-inch pot, that if they are root-bound in any way, um, or you can simply, they have good roots, but they're all, you can see them at the bottom of the pot. You want to gently loosen that soil to give your plants a good start.
So here's an example of a pot with uh, the grasses as your thriller planted in the middle. Um, we have the creeping Jenny, that's your spiller, going over the side. And it looks like some pansies or petunias here acting as filler. And by the way, some plants can act as both a filler and a spiller. And many pansies and petunias, when they grow, uh, not only fill out a space, but can drape over the side. So one doesn't necessarily, they're not mutually exclusive, is what I'm trying to say. And even with a small planter, um, you can use this concept. So this is a frog planter that has about a six inch opening. And this is actually my planter. And I filled it with calabrosia um, or a million bells, some geranium here and um, and verbena. So, you know, again, just experiment around um, and see what you can, what you like, what plants do you gravitate towards. Some plants have scents, maybe scents are really important to you. So you wanna, they're scented geraniums. And this one happens to be a scented geranium that's in this planter. So here's examples of lush containers, the one on the right using an evergreen uh, type shrub, Whoop, let's go back, shrub. And you can use ivy as a spiller. So many different combinations. Just think about when you look at hanging baskets, like what is spilling over, right? So this is this similar container just plant it up differently, but both convey this feeling of lush uh, plantings. And this is my garden. So most of the photos in this presentation were taken either by myself or another master gardener who I acknowledge at the end of the presentation. So this is a, um, I put this in because in this application, I'm doing, I started my planter and I just had string of pearls. That's a really, another good spiller uh, to have in a planter. And then I added these succulents. And in this case, you can see the succulent is the tallest thing in my uh, Grecian head planter. And so that acts as my thriller. And I have forget-me-nots that just happen to reseed and plant in there as my filler and the string of pearls as my spiller. So planting. So what do we do to plant up a good container? Um, well, first of all, let's talk about what we don't do. So why don't we use garden soil? So we don't use garden soil in containers because it may contain weeds, pests, or pathogens. And oftentimes garden soil, it's not nutritionally balanced and it's very heavy. So that's gonna make, you may think you're saving money and you are saving some money, but it's gonna make your planters extremely heavy. So these are the principal, three principal reasons we don't use garden soil. So we're not endorsing, the master gardeners don't endorse any specific brand, or um, we just happen to have these photos. Of, there's all kinds of potting soils that are, stump, that are sold. Um, and so just find the one that you like best. And every major nursery uh, in San Francisco, you know, we have slope, we have flora grub, we have fl uh, flower craft nursery. 
um, they all sell garden soils and they all sell a variety of garden soils. And many of them have samples out of their garden soil that you can actually um, put in your hand and feel. So you want a soil that has good drainage and air circulation. Um, many people prefer organic soil because some of the organic soils have mycorrhizal fungi that are added to them. Um, some new versions of soils have water retention properties added. Um, one thing you can do for your own containers is if you have a compost um, pile or container, it could even be a small one, you can add some compost uh, to your container gardens to increase the water retention. Oops. Now we'll talk about feeding the plants. So container plants, you have to watch them a little bit more closely than you would with plants in the garden. And that is because they need more frequent watering and the more frequent watering and irrigation flushes the fertilizer out. So you will have to feed your plants to keep them looking robustly healthy and flowering and abundant. Um, so organic fertilizers are the best for many reasons, including the salt buildup. Um, which does affect your plant's ability to absorb nutrients like calcium. And organic often have microbes, as we mentioned, and it's less likely to encourage weak, unhealthy growth. So there's many different all-purpose fertilizers on the market. And so what you look for, and, and one thing um, that many people like to do um, and many master gardeners like to do is to add sure start when they're first starting off their container gardening and you mix that into the soil and that will buy you about six to eight weeks and please follow the directions on the box when it says to mix in you know half a cup to you know uh a, a, a cubic foot or a half a cubic foot of soil, look at your bag and how much does your uh, potting soil contain in that bag and follow the directions because you don't want to burn your plants and adding too much fertilizer will do that. So there's different starter products out there. And again, um, we're not endorsing one particular product, but you want to look for something with a balanced from that point on, after you give it a starter fertilizer with a balance NPK, and the N stands for it's whenever you look at a fertilizer product, you'll see the three numbers on the liquid fertilizer or on the carton. And the first one is nitrogen, the N, and the P is phosphorus, and the K is uh, the symbol for potassium. So you want to look for a balanced NPK, something along the level of uh, a 10, 10, and 10 would be fine. Um, but, you know, you may find that uh, even a 5, 5, and 5, it just depends on how heavy your feeders are in your container. The one cardinal rule is no rocks on the bottom of your container. And why is that? Um, everyone feels like if they put rocks down there, that it's good for the drainage, but it actually is not good for your drainage. In fact, the finer potting soil will hold on to that moisture, moisture rather than releasing it to the gravel. And then your roots will get soggy and unhappy, and then your plants are unhappy and they're cheated out of their growing medium. So no rocks on the bottom. If you're concerned about water draining out too quickly from your pot, there's mesh screens that they sell in the nursery that you can place at the bottom of your pot to moderate that somewhat. 
and those are fine to use. They look like a fine uh, screening material. So putting it all together, how do we put this all together now? It's a lot of information in a short period of time, but here are probably the best tips I could share with you. Water all your plants well. Um, when you're adding that starter fertilizer, um, mix half the fertilizer into the middle of your container, the middle of the container with the soil. Um, when you take on the left-hand picture, um, the plant has been taken out of the pot and you could see there, this is what I was talking about earlier, you could see those roots sort of around the side and the bottom. You want to gently loosen those roots, just like it shows in the picture. Um, and that means when you put it in your planting medium, your soil, those roots are already loose and they're going to start spreading out and making a home and burrowing down and getting rooted. And that's what you want. Um, so you start in the center of the pot, like planting your thriller, as we talked about. You make sure the root ball uh, has good contact with the soil on all sides. And you definitely can then distribute your remaining fertilizer into the top one inch. So remember, you put half in the middle and then half as you're building up your planter with soil in the remaining one inch. And water well. Now, what does that mean? Um, I took a, a class on irrigation and watering and the instructor there who was very well respected um, said whenever she planted a, especially a larger deeper container she had a stand out there with a hose and water that container you know if it's if it's 18 inches taller taller it's going to take a while for that water to drain out but on a very slow like a beyond an ooze, but less than like basically a steady weak flow of water. She would have us water the container thoroughly when we were starting it to get the container, the water to drain out one time. And then we would do it again after it was all drained a second time. And then we would do it a third time. And that's only at the beginning, because remember, this is all new soil and you don't want to pump it hard with a forced flow of water. So and you don't want to be there all day with your hose. So on this steady light flow of water, we would do that. And it takes a little time, but you're getting your plants off to a good start with water. So that's what we mean by watering well in the beginning and then watering well throughout also. And your plants sometimes will tell you, um, they will tell you if they need water. They'll start drooping or not acting happy. Um, another test you can do is use a water meter. Many people love those and they use those. You know, other gardeners use the index finger tip where you dive your index finger down into the dirt and if and then you bring it up, up out of the dirt and that's the soil and that you see by your first knuckle is any of that soil adhering to your finger and if it is and it feels kind of moist you're okay but if it isn't and it comes up dry the finger test very unscientific but it comes in handy when you're out there and you don't have a water meter and you want a quick check. So this picture I took outside of anthropology and Walnut Creek. I don't normally go to Walnut Creek, uh, but I was visiting a friend 
and she was picking up something at anthropology. And these were the planters that they had outside their store door. So I like to throw out the question, and some of you can type in the chat, addressing it to everyone. Now that we've discussed the principles of the pot size in relationship to the plant and what makes a successful container, and remember, there's no wrong ideas. So I'm throwing it out to all of you to enter into the chat. What do you think is wrong with this picture? And there are definitely some things wrong here. So take a stab at it, uh, write in the chat uh, what you think. And by the way, we're taking questions at the end of the presentation. So any questions that you have, you can also put in the chat. This was in Safiro Gardens in Sweden. And again, um, this was the Gardens of Royalty, the Swedish king and queen. And they have this crown symbol. But I was struck by it because, again, you see the principles of filler, thriller, spiller with the verbena in coming up through the top of the crown as the thriller uh, forget-me-nots in the middle as the filler, and then again, uh, the pansies and as being used as spiller in this context. It's a beautiful picture. Here's the same terracotta container. There's just so many choices, but it's the same basic, you know, tried and true terracotta container planted with different filler, spiller, and thrillers, just to give you an idea of three ways. And the other great thing about containers, by the way, as, as the season progresses, especially if you put some annuals in there in spring, and now we're going into fall, you know, you, you can then take out, maybe your thriller stays the same and your ivy spiller stays the same. But you can pull those out and change them out and get a different look. So on the left is coleus as thriller, and you have uh, begonia as the filler, and you have ivy, trailing ivy as the spiller. You could also plant edible flowers in containers. We have calendula, flowering sage, rose geranium, nasturtium. Many people, and I myself put nasturtium and um, calendula petals in salads. So your tips for growing herbs in container is water, water, water. Your soil dries out quickly. Uh, we talked about potting soil, caddies, placing your containers on a trolley or caddy to follow the sun. I mean, a lot of plants, I mean, look, you're going to look at your labels if you have a, a shade environment, like coleuses do pretty well in the shade. There's plants that do well. Um, herbs are heavy feeders, so you would want a slug release organic fertilizer. And harvest your, your flowers and plants and herbs often to keep them bushy and to retain the flavor in the leaves and harvest your older stems first. And choose herbs of similar size for the same pot. So does size matter? In this case, you can see and having a monoculture um, is what this pot embodies here. And those can be interesting too. Um, so this, in this case, we have rosemary officinalis planted in this bigger pot all by itself. But if you look at this, and if you take the concepts of what we were talking about, you have the 
thriller aspect and that this is growing upright in the back of the photo. It's filling the pot and it's spilling over, right? And it's a big pot because rosemary's have very sturdy, um, long-reaching root systems. So this pot required that the rosemary, blooming rosemary, be planted all by itself. And keep your herbs cut back so one doesn't crowd out another. And if you are planting herbs or mixing in herbs with your, uh, remember that Mediterranean varieties like to be planted together. So our Mediterranean varieties are rosemary, oregano, sage, thyme, marjoram, and lavender, where moisture loving herbs also want it to be, they prefer moisture in their soil, so if you start mixing basil with a rosemary or tarragon with a thyme, it's not going to work out successfully over time because um, one group requires more moisture um, than the other Mediterranean group. So just be aware, always read your labels, how much sun, how much shade, uh, and plant those needing less water together and those needing more water together. So the herbs that don't survive in pots. So those include all the members of the mint family. Um, they're listed here um, and also lemon ball. And why don't mints survive in pots? because they are spreading plants. They send out runners, they grow sideways. And the constraint of the pot, no matter how big, prevents them from spreading out. And those of you who have ever grown mint in a garden, realize you could plant it in one patch in a corner of a garden. And in no time at all, it sends out these runners and you have mint coming up like, six, eight feet away. So don't plant those in pots. And then I encourage you to be creative. I mean, there's those standard pots that we mentioned in the beginning, all the different kinds, but look around um, and consider other pot post possibilities um, because almost anything can be a container. You could lose, use lots of imagination. All you need is a cordless drill and provide a minimum of a half inch drainage hole and you're set to go. So let me give you some examples. We'll go through these quickly because I do want to leave time for questions. So look in your garage. Uh, be sure to provide that drainage hole and leave a two inch reservoir for water at the top of your container. So we had old paint cans there thought this were quite artistic. Um, keeping on the painting th theme, we have an old paint tray that's mounted on a fence. Happen to love the rustic look of this that's planted with succulents. It's pretty cool. You can look in your closet. Um, this is a, a kind of cute, a little bit girly, but creative. Uh, garden party uh, exhibit where old hats were taken. And as long as you put a liner in there with soil and you're able to water it and you never want to wear that hat again, then this is a great idea. Here we have an old kitchen bread box. Um, we have some trash cans that were uh, these this, these were actually done by middle a middle school um, and decorated. I think they're quite whimsical, but they're doing the job right, right. And they're they're a conversation starter. This I saw at a home and garden show, where a, a desk was taken with the drawers opened and a drainage hole provided. 
and a plastic liner put inside each drawer. And they're overflowing in abundance with gorgeous plants. And then um, here's, I like this photo because it emphasizes the contrasting colors we were talking about before the purple uh, pansies with the orange salmon colored calabrosia, you know, and then as your thriller, and this is the thriller filler spiller concept, there's your, um, you know, your, your uh, palladium plant in the back. Your container must be functional. So um, many people have used it. Again, this was a home and garden show. Rain gutters, downspouts, building flues, magazine racks, toolboxes, old tins, in this case, with an old bathtub, all they had to do was leave the plug out for drainage, right? And then if you need to divide any plants, it's just, Quick afterthought, remove the entire plant from your the container and then use a sharp gardening knife like the Hori Hori knife to divide it into sections. Here's some um, purses, again, lined with plastic, drainage hole provided. Um, this would be for obviously not the wet weather, a spring summer presentation. Uh, we have shoes. Uh, one of my master gardener friends actually got these shoes at Goodwill and um, dressed them up with succulents. Same can be done with boots, um, rubber boots I've seen used. Um, on the right, that looks like a pair of old work boots. Again, with that drill and, and uh, drainage, you're good to go. Here's a sculpture that I actually made years ago. And you could see in this application, I'm using it as a cash po for the hydrangea, which is in bloom. Um, old pedestal sinks can be put to new use in a garden. And again, taking that plug out for drainage. And I just want to share with you some shots of my garden um, and in bloom. And my garden actually won a flower craft gardening award. And I'm trying to think now, it's 2015. And there's, I have to honor my kitty Silas. And you can see the nasturtiums growing and some calendula popping over and he likes to kind of nestle right there by the nasturtiums. And then this is a photo that I took. Um, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make here is appreciate, you know, the beauty that surrounds you. And a gardening instructor said to me once, if you're always working in your garden and you never take time to really look and see it, and enjoy it, then you're missing out on a really important part of life. And that concept from 30, 35 years ago has stayed with me all my life. So in, in bringing it home to this particular photo, I had <clears throat> a dragonfly that was on my, these, these are actually geraniums that Look, if you really look up close to that geranium in the background, it almost looks like it's hand painted. And the dragonfly was resting on the plant um, in a container that I had planted. And I just love this um, photo. It resonates with me because of that remembrance to take time and enjoy um, what you've created. So today I want to acknowledge San Francisco Public Libraries um, and the main libraries specifically for hosting the presentation. Um, and 
The photographs were taken by either myself or Lauren, Laurel Nagel, who's also a master garden gardener, that are in this presentation. We have a great uh, resources for you. Some of these have been circulating in the chat, in the revolving chat. So we have a monthly newsletter full of power packed information you can subscribe to. Um, the website is here. It's also been circulating in the chat. Um, we are always open to donations to our program. Um, and here's a way to do that. And we have this wonderful resource right here in San Francisco uh, at the Botanical Garden. It's our helpline, and they're open Tuesdays from 1030 to 130. Um, or you can call the helpline, and that's been in the chat. Um, and um, if you do, please provide all your important information for someone to get back to you and the best time for them to call. So this is a service, right, that is free to any resident. So you've got a problem with, let's say, you know, your uh, citrus tree isn't doing well this year or you've got certain bugs on uh, your lemon tree, something's eating your lemon tree leaves, what is it? So you are able to send photos and questions and send good photos, or they'll ask you for them. Um, in helping these experienced master gardeners evaluate your particular issue and get back to you with recommendations. We also have a helpline in Elkis Ranch in Half Moon Bay and one in uh, the Veterans Memorial Senior Center in Redwood City for those of you from the peninsula and their hours are listed, days and hours are listed here. And I just want to show this. I have a few little fans here in Noe Valley. Um, and so I use the concept of this was gosh, this was almost four and a half years ago now, it was pre-pandemic, where if any of you ever go to the Noe Valley Town Square on 24th Street and look at their fiberglass, remember I said lightweight, on wheels, movable and portable planters, well, I designed those planters for the Noe Valley Town Square, and they're still thriving. We've had to pull out just, I think, maybe three plants and there's five planters and they're all in this big half moon shape. Um, and so what's great is they do a farmer's market there every Saturday. So the planters can all be moved to the side, right? So other events and concerts can happen there. And then when the, the event is over, they move them back into any configuration um, that they want for the town square. So it's a lovely, uh, Lovely addition. I feel grateful that I was able to donate to my community in that way. Um, <clears throat> for my references today, I used uh, Pam Pierce, Golden Gate Gardening. Um, and I also use another Pam Pierce book, which is not listed, called Widely Successful Plants for Northern California. And I used our Master Gardener Handbook. And we have our website listed here um, for uh, resources for all of you. And that concludes, I'm going to go back and leave the helpline information up um, for just a couple more minutes. But that concludes my program today. And oh, now yeah, I first yeah. wanted to start with, if anybody put in the chat room, what was 
Aridi, we do have, um, uh, this is Marsha, we do have a number of questions for you. Okay. Uh, but before I get into that, I also just want to share that you're getting a lot of thank yous and great information, and there's a lot in the chat. Hopefully, you'll have a chance to look Fantastic. at that. Fantastic. Thank you, Marsha. So um, first, uh, one of our questions uh, goes to the uh, slide that you had about arranging uh, your planter with the thriller, filler, and spiller. How would you arrange, what plant arrangement would you recommend if you're only going to view the planter from two sides? How would you modify that arrangement? If I was only going to view the planter from two sides rather than just straightforward i would i would do the arrangement um to be i would put the i'd still put the thriller in the middle i would put the thriller in the mid, middle and the spiller and filler around it so uh, the only time you put the thriller in the back and change that arrangement is when you're only viewing the planter from the front okay great um, a question about orchids. Now, you didn't talk specifically about orchids, but um, what fertilizer uh, do I need for orchids was one of the questions. Okay, so they sell, <clears throat> um, it, I just went to an orchid workshop that another one of our master gardeners gave. They sell a specific orchid fertilizer. They're usually liquid. And all the nurseries that I previously mentioned and there's probably more in San Francisco sell that. So I would go in and ask for an orchid fertilizer because they have a different NPK rating than the fertilizers I was talking about today. Okay. Um, now we had two questions about poinsettias. So everyone must have invested in poinsettias over the holidays. <laughs> One question is, do you have any tips about caring for a poinsettia that's in a pot? And just to follow that up, uh, do you do you recommend transplanting the poinsettia? Maybe you shouldn't transplant it. Uh, is there an issue about, you know, this poinsettia only has three red leaves left. So when, when would you transplant if you did? How would you care for it? Well, I wouldn't transplant it, number one. I would not. Um, and poinsettias um, are definitely, this is the time, in fact, started uh, probably in February that they start dropping their leaves. Um, so the, the key, I only had one poinsettia myself ever come back. And I followed all the instructions. So don't use my experience. As I said, this is a living laboratory. Try it yourself. But it is to keep that poinsettia in a kind of a protected place. Let it drop its leaves. So I found this little corner off my patio that's protected from the wind. And I put it over there. And you kind of let it go dormant. And then... Um, before it blooms again, you're supposed to bring it into a dark place like a basement or a garage. And again, I'm no poinsettia expert, but, <clears throat> and then if all is well, you bring it out when it starts to leaf out again. So, but please, um, I would say for, I would, as I'm walking through this and because I haven't had success. I would strongly encourage you to call our helpline, and I have that number up on the screen right now, to call or email our helpline and ask if uh, what they recommend. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so this question goes back to drainage holes, and you had some just great examples of um, different kinds of containers and creative uses of different kinds of containers. And, and I could see putting drainage holes with the drill in metal 
or some of the other kinds of things you have. But this question is about um, what if your pot, I assume this is ceramic or clay, doesn't have a drainage hole in the bottom. Have you? Do you have any tips for putting drainage holes in ceramic or clay pots? Yes, I do. And this is an experience that was hard learned on my part. So um, the next time I went, so I did not have success. I ended up cracking the pot. And that's the risk you take. So the kind of pot I think the questioner probably has is actually considered a cash po or <clears throat> when there's no drainage hole. So it's meant to contain another uh, planter that goes within that pot and it's used for decorative purposes. But when I did ask, and so this is, I asked my contractor, I said, look, I tried drilling this hole in a ceramic pot and I ended up breaking it. Am I using the wrong size bit? Um, what would you recommend? And he turned to me and he said, what I'd recommend is don't try it in the first place or you'll lose your pot. Ceramic is just too fragile. So use that pot for what it was intended, being a decorative pot that another pot sits within. And maybe when you water that pot that sits within, you take it to your sink and water it and let it drain. But it's really not recommended um, unless you want to take the risk. Again, it's a laboratory. Um, and he said, you know, you could end up breaking your drill bit too. And drill bits aren't cheap. So consider all that before you try it yourself. Okay, great. <laughs> um, do you have any tips for growing basil in containers? Uh, yeah. the, the writer says, I keep trying and they get woody and the leaves wilt. Um, what would you do? What would I do? Mm. Well, I'd look at the location that you have the basil. Um, is it getting enough sun? Basils do like more water. So always look at your conditions first. Like what is the exposure? Um, sun or shade? Is it getting enough sun? And I basil and and what about water? The water needs of the plants. So, and, and, you know, realize that you're not alone. It's not the first time I've heard this question. A lot of people, you know, the basils look so good when you go into Whole Foods, you know, and they're selling them in the containers. And um, there's an assumption that these are really easy to grow over time. And you're not alone because oftentimes I've heard other people re report that over time, it gets woody. And are you, wait a minute, one last thing. Are you pinching that basil back? Because a plant gets really woody and starts, you know, uh, uh, over you know, gr growing um, uh, too much when it's not being pinched back. So are you using the basil? Are you pinching it back? So I'd say look at those three conditions first. And sometimes we just have to realize as gardeners, and this isn't being um, pessimistic or negative, but there's certain plants we just do better with than others in terms of routine care. And it's how much we really have to evaluate this as we go along. How much time and attention do I really have for this one particular plant or is there elsewhere I can be diverting my energies? And it's to say not to give up on the basil. Try the other things, the exposure, the water, the pinching back. And if you still continue to not have success, then I, I always say your plants are not your children. You can let go of them. <laughs> and so, so <laughs> take that. And I'm not saying that. I take that for what it's intended, that it's okay to say bye-bye to certain plants. Right. Okay. Um, here's a question. What spiller and fil 
filler would you plant with an older existing Norfolk pine? Oh, well, that depends on how big that pine is, um, <clears throat> what size container it's in. There's a lot of variables here, right? So is the, I would ask the uh, questionnaire to ask, is the Norfolk pine already in a container? What's the size of that container? But for water needs and how much water are you giving that Norfolk pine now? And then I would look at those water needs and um, transport them over to, you know, am I watering this plant just once a week, twice a week? Then I need to put some other plants. Remember, we said group plants together that have similar water needs and similar um, sunshade requirements, right? And then to be aware of the wind. So um, I think that's a good place to start for the questionnaire to address that, right? Okay, great. Thank you, Aridi. Um, So here's a question about, you know, sort of getting to your creative use of different kinds of containers. Yes. How, how do you recommend preparing an old tree stump or do you recommend preparing an old tree stump as a place for plants and for um, growing out of the tree stump and maybe spilling over the top? Are there uh, any recommendations for pr preparation for that? That's a good one. Um, no, I don't have any personal experience with that myself. Um, I'd say just off the top of my head, um, experiment. I mean, for the first thing I think I'd want to do is to get a hose and put water in that tree stump. And is it, is the water draining? If the water isn't draining and it's pooling in that tree stump, then that would not be a good environment for other container plants. So that's the first thing, the water test, right? Um, and I think that would be where I would start. In terms of what you would plant, let's say it is draining well, and you are able to put soil in it, and then I would evaluate your sun or shade. And if, if it's a shady environment, if it's around other trees, you might want to plant more shade-loving plants uh, like coleus, um, impatiens, right? Those are good combinations for shade. And, you know, you can certainly do a Google search for other shade-loving plants. But first, do the water test. And the one thing I didn't say about containers is if you're using containers from year to year, and let's say they've sat dormant over the winter and now, now it's spring and you want to use, you like these containers. And of course we want to reuse and repurpose, right? And you want to reuse them again. The one thing that's recommended is that you scrub. This could even be a clay container um, it could be a metal one that you've used. You want to make sure that you sand the metal one so there's no corrosion in there. But for a regular container, you want to scrub it out um, with soap and water and get rid of sometimes salts accumulate on the edge of the container. And then another recommendation is that you then soak your pots. Some people recommend an old sink or a wheelbarrow with a solution of 10% bleach to um, so one part bleach to nine parts water. And you let those pots soak for 10 minutes. And that's so you don't carry over any, um, any infections, whether they be fungus in origin or um, that were maybe remaining from previous plants that were in that container. It's just kind of a good hygienic, uh, appropriate way to get a clean start in the spring with reusing your containers. Great. 
Thank you. Um, and Aridi, I think this might be our last question. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, and we're at um, uh, 324. Okay, great. So this is a question actually about indoor uh, gardening, indoor plants. What type of container is best for growing strawberries on the kitchen counter near the window? Strawberries inside. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> if I were to start that, I would probably start with a plastic pot and <clears throat> or pots, depending on how many. And your window exposure should be sunny. Um, I'm not sure what your success rate would be. And, you know, again, this is a, uh, a question you might turn over to the helpline. Um, I've grown strawberries outside. I've never attempted them inside. So what your su success rate might be growing them inside. But the one good thing about your plastic containers is they're going to be more lightweight. And um, if you do need to move them, to an outdoor environment or bring them outside to a ledge or maybe you don't have an outdoors and that's why you're growing them inside, then you might want to donate them to a friend who does have an outdoor environment for them. Um, but I would, again, the lab experiment approach, try it and see what works and um, good luck. Good luck. I'd love to hear you know, and for any additional information, you can certainly contact our helpline on that. Have you, um, Masha, heard anything about growing strawberries inside? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I, I was almost going to recommend um, starting with something that might work better uh, in, uh, you know, some herbs might work yeah, better. Yeah, herbs would definitely be. People grow herbs. That's a good pointer, uh, Marsha. They definitely grow herbs on the windowsill and, uh, you know, um, things like, uh, oh gosh, um, you know, uh, you could try with, start out with some easy growing herbs like, you know, an oregano in a container. Um, I've also grown uh, mint is, again, too big, a, too big a root system. Um, gosh, I'm thinking of it now. Dill, dill is a bit fragile of an herb, so they sometimes like the protected environment of being on a windowsill. Can you think of any others, Marsha? I was thinking thyme or rosemary. Um, thyme or rosemary. Again, the Mediterranean family are your are your hardy ones. Yeah. And well, just before we close, I'm just curious. Did anyone put in the chat what they thought was wrong with the picture of anthropology? Yeah, we got some good comments about uh, how there wasn't any color. There were no spillers and fillers. The <laughs> planters looked dull. Uh, <laughs> and just uh, not, not overall, uh, you know, small tree, too large. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The dimension was was off. Those are all good responses. Yeah. 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 